Ja, ja, nu är det här. Jag sa så. Pias älgar. För ej sjukdom. Ogas. Och strad. Ej stej. Babelia. Jag sa så. Nu är det här. Ja, ja. Welcome to the 268th of the Cthulhu Podcasts. I'm Felbrick. Today, we're starting out with the opening part of Chapter 2 of Sir Ernest Shackleton's book, South. Then we'll follow up with the next part of the dark, horrifying future of mankind in The Nightland. Let's head south. A blizzard from the east-northeast prevented us leaving the shelter of the Berg on the following day, Sunday, January the 17th. The weather was clear, but the gale drove intense clouds of snow off the land and obscured the coastline most of the time. The land, seen when the air is clear, appears higher than we thought it yesterday. Probably it rises to 3,000 feet above the head of the glacier. Caird Coast, as I have named it, connects Coates Land, discovered by Bruce in 1904, with Leupold Land, discovered by Filcher in 1912. The northern part is similar in character to Coates Land, It is fronted by an undulating barrier, the van of a mighty ice sheet that is being forced outward from the high interior of the Antarctic continent, and apparently sweeping over low hills, plains, and shallow seas, as the great Arctic ice sheet once pressed over northern Europe. The barrier surface seen from the sea is of a faint golden-brown colour. It terminates usually in cliffs ranging from ten to three hundred feet in height, but in a very few places sweeps down level with the sea. The cliffs are of dazzling whiteness, with wonderful blue shadows. Far inland, higher slopes can be seen, appearing like dim blue or faint golden fleecy clouds. These distant slopes have increased in nearness and clearness as we've come to the southwest, while the barrier cliffs here are higher and apparently firmer. We are now close to the junction with Leupold Land, At this southern end of the Caird coast, the ice sheet undulating over the hidden and imprisoned land is bursting down a steep slope in tremendous glaciers, bristling with ridges and spikes of ice, and seamed by thousands of crevasses. Along the whole length of the coast we have seen no bare land or rock, not as much as a solitary nun attack has appeared to relieve the surface of ice and snow. But the upward sweep of the ice slopes towards the horizon and the ridges, terraces and crevasses that appear as the ice approaches the sea tell of the hills and valleys that lie beneath. The endurance lay under the lee of the stranded berg until 7am on January the 18th. The gale had moderated by that time and we proceeded under sail to the southwest through a lane that had opened along the glacier front. We skirted the glacier until 9.30am, when it ended in two bays, open to the northwest but sheltered by stranded bergs to the west. The coast beyond trended south-southwest with a gentle land slope. The pack now forces us to go west 14 miles, when we break through a long line of heavy brash mixed with large lumps of growlers. We do this under the fore topsail only, the engines being stopped to protect the propeller. This takes us into open water where we make south 50 degrees and west for 24 miles. Then we again encounter pack which forces us to the northwest for 10 miles when we're brought up by heavy snow lumps, brash and large loose flows. The character of the pack shows change. The flows are very thick and are covered by deep snow. The brash between the flows is so thick and heavy that we cannot push through without great expenditure of power and then for a short distance only. We therefore lie to for a while to see if the pack opens at all when this northeast wind ceases. Our position on the morning of the 19th was latitude 76 degrees 34 minutes south, longitude 31 degrees 30 minutes west. The weather was good, but no advance could be made. The ice had closed around the ship during the night, and no water could be seen in any direction from the deck. A few lanes were in sight from the masthead, and we sounded in 312 fathoms, finding mud, sand and pebbles. The land showed faintly to the east. We waited for the conditions to improve, and the scientists took the opportunity to dredge for biological and geological specimens. During the night, a moderate north-easterly gale sprang up, and for a survey of the position on the 20th, showed that the ship was firmly beset. The ice was packed heavily and firmly all around the endurance in every direction as far as the eye could reach from the masthead. 
There was nothing to be done until conditions should change, and we waited through that day and the succeeding days with increasing anxiety. The east nor easterly gale that had forced us to take shelter behind the stranded berg on the 16th had veered later to the northeast, and it continued with varying intensity until the 22nd. Apparently this wind had crowded the ice into the bight of the Weddell Sea, and the ship was now drifting southwest with the floes which had enclosed it. A slight movement of the ice round the ship caused the rudder to become dangerously jammed on the 21st, and we had to cut away the ice with ice chisels, heavy pieces of iron with six-foot wooden shafts. We kept steam up in readiness for a move if the opportunity offered, and the engines running full speed ahead helped to clear the rudder. Land was in sight to the east and south, about sixteen miles distant on the 22nd. The land ice seemed to be faced with ice cliffs at most points, but here and there slopes ran down to sea level. Large crevassed areas in terraces parallel with the coast showed where the ice was moving down over foothills. The inland ice appeared for the most part to be undulating, smooth and easy to march over, but many crevasses might have been concealed from us by the surface snow or the absence of shadows. I thought that the land probably rose to a height of five thousand feet, forty or fifty miles inland. The accurate estimation of heights and distances in the Antarctic is always difficult, owing to the clear air, the confusing monotony of colouring, and the deceptive effect of mirage and refraction. The land appeared to increase in height to the southward, where we saw a line of land and barrier that must have been seventy miles, and possibly was even more distant. Sunday, January the 24th, was a clear sunny day, with gentle easterly and southerly breezes. No open water could be seen from the masthead, but there was a slight water sky to the west and northwest. This is the first time for ten days that the wind had varied from north-east and east, and on five of these days it had risen to a gale. Evidently the ice has become firmly packed in this quarter, and we must wait patiently till a southerly gale occurs or currents open the ice. We are drifting slowly. The position today was 76 degrees 49 minutes south, 33 degrees 51 minutes west. Worsley and James, working on a flow with a Q magnometer, found the variation to be six degrees west. Just before midnight a crack developed in the ice five yards wide and a mile long, fifty yards ahead of the ship. The crack had widened to a quarter of a mile by 10 a.m. on the 25th, and for three hours we tried to force the ship into this opening with engines at full speed ahead and all sails set. The sole effect was to wash some ice away astern and to clear the rudder and after convincing myself that the ship was firmly held, I abandoned the attempt. Later in the day, Crean and two other men were over the side on a stage chipping at a large piece of ice that had got under the ship and appeared to be impeding her movement. The ice broke away suddenly, shot upward and overturned, pinning Crean between the stage and the haft of the heavy eleven-foot iron pincher. He was in danger for a few minutes, but we got him clear, suffering merely from a few bad bruises, the thick iron bar had been bent against him to an angle of forty-five degrees. The days that followed were uneventful. Moderate breezes from the east and southwest had no apparent effect upon the ice, and the ship remained firmly held. On the twenty-fourth, the tenth day of inactivity, I decided to let the fires go out. We had been burning a half a ton of coal a day to keep the steam in the boilers, and as the bunkers now contained only sixty-seven tons, representing thirty-three days of steaming, we could not afford to continue this expenditure of fuel. Land still showed to the east and south when the horizon was clear. The biologist was securing some interesting specimens with a hand dredge at various depths. A sounding on the twenty-sixth gave three hundred and sixty fathoms, and another on the twenty-ninth four hundred and forty-nine fathoms. The drift was to the west, and an observation on the thirty-first, a Sunday, showed that the ship had made eight miles during the week. James and Hudson rigged the wireless in the hope of hearing the monthly message from the Falkland Islands. This message would be due about 3.20 a.m. on the following morning, but James was doubtful about hearing anything with our small apparatus at a distance of 1,630 miles from the dispatching station. We heard nothing, as a matter of fact, but later efforts were similarly unsuccessful. The conditions would have been difficult even for a station of high power. 
We were accumulating, gradually, a stock of seal meat during these days of waiting. Fresh meat for the dogs was needed, and seal steaks and liver made a very welcome change from the ship's rations aboard the Endurance. Four crab-eaters and three weddles, over a ton of meat for dog and man, fell to our guns on February the 2nd, and all hands were occupied most of the day getting the carcasses back to the ship over the rough ice. We rigged three sledges for man haulage, and brought the seals about two miles, the sledging parties being guided amongst the ridges and pools by semaphore from the crow's nest. Two more seals were sighted on the far side of a big pool, but I did not allow them to be pursued. Some of the ice was in a treacherous condition, with thin films hiding cracks and pools, and I did not wish to risk an accident. A crack about four miles long opened in the flow to the stern of the ship on the third. The narrow lane in front was still open, but the prevailing light breezes did not seem likely to produce any useful movement in the ice. Early on the morning of the 5th, a north-easterly gale sprang up, bringing overcast skies and thick snow. Soon the pack was opening and closing without much loosening effect. At noon the ship gave a sudden start and heeled over three degrees. Immediately afterwards a crack ran from the bows to the lead ahead and another to the lead astern. I thought it might be possible to reeve the ship through one of these leads towards the open water, but we could see no water through the thick snow, and before steam was raised and while the view was still obscured, the pack closed again. The northerly gale had given place to light westerly breezes on the 6th. The pack seemed to be more solid than ever. It stretched almost unbroken to the horizon in every direction, and the situation was made worse by very low temperatures in succeeding days. The temperature was down to zero on the night of the 7th, and was two degrees below zero on the 8th. This cold spell in midsummer was most unfortunate from our point of view, since it cemented the pack and tightened the grip of the ice upon the ship. The slow drift to the southwest continued, and we caught occasional glimpses of distant uplands on the eastern horizon. The position on the 7th was latitude 76 degrees 57 minutes south, longitude 35 degrees 7 minutes west. Soundings on the 6th and 8th found glacial mud at 630 and 529 fathoms. The endurance was lying in a pool covered by young ice on the 9th. The solid flows had loosened their grip on the ship itself, but they were packed tightly all around. The weather was foggy. We felt a slight northerly swell coming through the pack, and the moment gave rise to hope that there was open water near us. At 11am a long crack developed in the pack running east and west as far as we could see through the fog, and I ordered steam to be raised in the hope of being able to break away into this lead. The effort failed. We could break the young ice in the pool, but the pack defied us. The attempt was renewed on the 11th, a fine clear day with blue sky. The temperature was still low, minus two degrees Fahrenheit at midnight. After breaking through some young ice, the endurance became jammed against a soft flow. The engines, running full speed astern, produced no effect until all hands joined in sallying the ship. The dog kennels amidships made it necessary for the people to gather aft, where they rushed from side to side in a mass in the confined space around the wheel. This was a ludicrous affair, the men falling over one another amid shouts of laughter without producing much effect on the ship. She remained fast, while all hands jumped at the word of command, but finally slid off when the men were stamping hard at the double. We were now in a position to take advantage of any opening that might appear. The ice was firm around us, and there seemed small chance of making a move that day. I had the motor crawler and warper put out on the flow for a trial run. The motor worked most successfully, running at about six miles an hour over slabs and ridges of ice hidden by a foot or two of soft snow. The surface was worse than we would expect to face on land or ice barrier. The motor warped itself back on a 500 fathom steel wire and was taken aboard again. From the masthead, the mirage is continually giving us false alarms. Everything wears an aspect of unreality. Icebergs hang upside down in the sky. The land appears as layers of silvery or golden cloud. Cloud banks look like land, icebergs masquerade as islands or nunataks, and the distant barrier to the south is thrown into view, although it really is outside our range of vision. Worst of all is the deceptive appearance of open water, caused by the refraction of distant water or the sun shining at an angle on the field of smooth snow 
or the face of ice cliffs below the horizon. The second half of February produced no important change in our situation. Early in the morning of the 14th I ordered a good head of steam on the engines and sent all hands onto the floe with ice chisels, prickers, saws and picks. We worked all day and throughout most of the next day in a strenuous effort to get the ship into the lead ahead. The men cut away the young ice before the bows and pulled it aside with great energy, and after twenty-four hours' labour we'd got the ship through a third of the way to the lead. But about four hundred yards of heavy ice, including old rafted pack, still separated the endurance from the water, and reluctantly I had to admit that further effort was useless. Every opening we made froze up again quickly, owing to the unseasonably low temperature. The young ice was elastic and prevented the ship delivering a strong splitting blow to the floe, while at the same time it held the older ice against any movement. The abandonment of the attack was a great disappointment to all hands. The men had worked long hours without thought of rest, and they deserved success. But the task was beyond our powers. I had not abandoned hope of getting clear, but was counting now on the possibility of having to spend a winter in the inhospitable arms of the pack. The sun, which had been above the horizon for two months, set at midnight on the 17th, and although it would not disappear until early April, its slanting rays warned us of the approach of winter. Pools and leads appeared occasionally, but they froze over very quickly. We continued to accumulate a supply of seal meat and blubber, and the excursions across the floes to shoot and bring in the seals provided welcome exercise for all hands. Three crab-eater cows shot on the 21st were not accompanied by a bull, and blood was to be seen about the hole from which they had crawled. We surmised that the bull had become the prey of one of those killer whales. These aggressive creatures were to be seen often in the lanes and pools, and we were always distrustful of their ability or willingness to discriminate between seal and man. A lizard-like head would show while the killer gazed along the flow with wicked eyes. Then the brute would dive, to come up a few moments later perhaps under some unfortunate seal reposing on the ice. Worsley examined a spot where a killer had smashed a hole eight feet by twelve feet in twelve inches of hard ice covered by two inches of snow. Big blocks of ice had been tossed onto the flow surface. Wordy, engaged in measuring the thickness of the young ice, went through to his waist one day just as a killer rose to blow in the adjacent lead. His companions pulled him out hurriedly. On the 22nd, the Endurance reached the furthest south point of her drift, touching the 77th parallel of latitude in longitude, 35 degrees west. The summer had gone. Indeed, the summer had scarcely been with us at all. The temperatures were low day and night, and the pack was freezing solidly around the ship. The thermometer recorded ten degrees below zero Fahrenheit at 2 a.m. on the 22nd. Some hours earlier we had watched a wonderful golden mist to the southward, where the rays of the declining sun shone through the vapour rising from the ice. All normal standards of perspective vanish under such conditions, and the low ridges of the pack, with mist lying between them, gave the illusion of a wilderness of mountain peaks like the Benice Oberland. I could not doubt now that the endurance was confined for the winter. Gentle breezes from the east, south and southwest did not disturb the hardening flows. The seals were disappearing and the birds were leaving us. The land still showed in fair weather on the distant horizon, but it was beyond our reach now, and regrets for havens that lay behind us were in vain. We must wait for the spring, which may bring us better fortune. If I had guessed a month ago that the ice would grip us here, I would have established our base at one of the landing places at the greater glacier, but there seemed no reason to anticipate then that the fates would prove unkind. This calm weather with intense cold in a summer month is surely exceptional. My chief anxiety is the drift. Where will the vagrant winds and currents carry the ship during the long winter months which are ahead of us? We will go west, no doubt, but how far? And will it be possible to break out of the pack early in the spring and reach Vassal Bay, or some other suitable landing place? These are momentous questions for us. On February 24th we ceased to observe ship routine, and the Endurance became a winter station. All hands were on duty during the day and slept at night, except a watchman who looked after the dogs and watched for any sign of movement in the ice. 
We cleared a space of ten feet by twenty feet round the rudder and propeller, soaring through ice two foot thick and lifting the blocks with a pair of tongs made by the carpenter. Green used the blocks to make an ice house for the dog Sally, which had added a little litter of pups to the strength of the expedition. Seals appeared occasionally, and we killed all that came within our reach. They represented fuel as well as food for man and dog. Orders were given for the afterhold to be cleared and the stores checked, so that we might know exactly how we stood for a siege by the Antarctic winter. The dogs went off the ship the following day. Their kennels were placed on a floe along a length of wire rope to which leashes were fastened. The dogs seemed heartily glad to leave the ship, and yelped loudly and joyously as they were moved to their new quarters. We'd begun the training of teams, and already they were keen rivalry between the drivers. The flat floes and frozen leads in the neighbourhood of the ship made excellent training grounds. Hockey and football on the floe were our chief recreations, and all hands joined in many a strenuous game. Walsley took a party to the floe on the 26th, and started building a line of igloos or dogloos round the ship. These little buildings were constructed Eskimo fashion, of big blocks of ice with thin sheets for roofs. Boards or frozen sealskins were placed over all, and snow was piled on top and pressed into the joints, and then water was thrown over the structures to make everything firm. The ice was packed down flat inside and covered with snow for the dogs, which preferred, however, to sleep outside except when the weather was extraordinarily severe. The tethering of the dogs was a simple matter. The end of a chain was buried at eight inches in the snow, and some fragments of ice were pressed around it, and a little water was poured over all. The icy breath of the Antarctic cemented it in a few moments. The dogs which had been ailing were shot. Some of the dogs were suffering badly from worms, and the remedies at our disposal, unfortunately, were not effective. All the fit dogs were being exercised in the sledges, and they took to the work with enthusiasm. Sometimes their eagerness to be off and away produced laughable results, but the drivers learned to be alert. The wireless apparatus was still rigged but we listened in vain for the Saturday night-time signals from New Year Island, ordered for our benefit by the Argentine government. On Sunday the 28th, Hudson waited at 2am for the Port Stanley monthly signals, but could hear nothing. Evidently the distances were just too great for our small plant. And now it's time to return to the horrors of the Nightland, with Chapter 5. Chapter 5. Into the Nightland. Now, after the destruction which had come upon the Ten Thousand, and the fresh assurance that was upon us of the terror of the Nightland, it may be known that there could be no more thought to succour, though in truth those youths that went now upon the road where the silent ones walk were far beyond our aid. Yet might it be thought that we should have signalled to them, calling by the home call which was that great voice which went forth from the machine above the sealed base of the mighty pyramid, but this we might not do. For then we gave signal to the monsters of the land, that some were now even abroad from the pyramid. Yet we could do no more than hope that the evil forces had no wotting of them. For in verity none might ever know the knowledge or the ignorance which those powers did possess. Yet it must be kept in mind that we knew even then there was an influence abroad in the land, strange and quiet, so that the instruments did not more than make a record of it, and, as I have surely set down ere now, we had belief that it did come from that house of silence, afar in the nightland upon that low hill to the north of the great road, and many amongst the monstrowakans feared that it was directed upon the youths, but of this there could be no surety, and we could but wait and watch. Now about this time those poor youths did draw nigh to that part of the road where the silent ones walk, where it turned more swiftly to the north, and they to be now at no mighty distance from that grim and horrid house. And presently we knew that the influence had a greater power in the land, and I had assuredness that it came from the house, yet no certain proof was this. But I set out my feelings to the master Monstrowakan, and he had trust in them, and in my power. Moreover, he also had belief within himself that some secret power came out from the house of silence. And some talk there was at times, that we send the home call into the night and to give warning to the youths of our knowledge and our fear, and to entreat them to make a safe endeavour to return swiftly. Yet was this an error, 
and refused by the master monstruacan, for it did not meet that we should put the souls of those youths in peril until such time as we had certainty that they should be lost if we did not bestir ourselves. For indeed this home call was as mighty voice, calling over the world, and did have so exceeding a noise that it had immediately told all in the land that there were some yet abroad from the great redoubt. And here will I set down how that home call had no use in those ages, but had been a call in the olden time when yet the great flying ships went abroad over the world. And there passed now a day and a night, and in all that time there ceased not great multitudes to peer forth into the night land at the youths. For it was known concerning their influence, and all felt that the youths did draw nigh very speedy to their fate. And much talk there was, and many things said, and much foolish speech, and kind intent, but no courage to go forth to make further attempt to rescue, which in truth calls not for great astonishment, as I have surely writ and oft thought. And in this place let me set down that the land was, as might be said, waked and unquiet, and a sense of things passing in the night and of horrid watchfulness. And there were at this time and at that low roars that went out across the land. And if I have not told the same before this time, it must be set to count against me and my telling, for indeed I should have writ it down before this place. Yet is the difficulty of my great task, and all must bear with me and entreat for me that I have courage so that I may come at last and strength and wisdom to tell all that I did see. Now, in the space of this day and night, it was known that the youths had not slept, neither had they eaten safe once, as they who had been watching through the great spyglass did affirm. But they did to hasten away at woeful speed towards the north, along the great dismal road, so that presently they must cease, or slay themselves with their endeavour. And all this did surety to our fears that they were under a spell from that horrid house afar in the land. And we had an assurance that this thing was, for presently there came a monstruacan to the master monstruacan, to report that there had come suddenly a mighty influence into the land, and in the same moment as it might be, I spied through the great glass, and did see those youths break swiftly from the road where the silent ones walk, and begin to run very swift that they might come quickly to the house of silence. Then did the master monstruacan hesitate not, but did send the home call across the world, Ay, even to those poor doomed ones that hastened unknowing to the terror which did compel them. And immediately upon the sound, the master did send a message to the natural eye in the set language, and made warning that they suffered themselves to be drawn to their destruction by a force that came from within the house of silence. And he besought them to put forth the strength of their spirits and do battle for their souls. And if they could in no ways compass a victory over that which drew them onwards, to slay themselves quickly, ere they went into that house of horror of utter destruction. And in all the pyramid there was a great silence, for the bellowing of the home call bred a quietness, because of that which it did portend, and it was swiftly known by the millions that the master monstruacan did plead for the souls of the youths, and there went forth unknowing a counterforce from the mighty pyramid, by reason of the prayers and soul-wishings of the countless millions, and the counterforce was plain to my inward hearing, and beat all the ether of the world into a surge of supplication, so that it stunned my spirit with the great power of it, and it seemed to me, as it were, that there was a vast spiritual noise in all the night, and I spied tremblingly through the great spyglass, and lo, the youths did cease from their swift running, and were come together in a crowd, and had a seeming to be confused, as might some who have waked suddenly from a sleep to find that they had walked in their sleep and had come to a strange place. Then came there a great roar from all the millions that spied the embrasures. From nigh five hundred thousand embrasures did they look, and I count not the great view-tables, and the shouting rose up like to a roaring of a mighty wind of triumph. Yet was it over early to sound for victory, for the counter-force which came from the intensity of so many wills bent to one intent was break and the evil force which came forth out of the house did draw the youths again, so that they heeded not their salvation, but turned once again to their running. And the mighty pyramid was full of a shaken silence, 
and immediately of lamentation and sorrow and horror at this thing. But in that moment there did happen a fresh wonder, for there grew suddenly before those poor youths billows of mist, as it had been a pure white fire shining very chill, yet giving no light upon them. And the mist of cold fire stayed their way, so that we had knowledge that there fought for the souls of them one of those sweet powers of goodness, which we had belief did strive to ward our spirits at all times from those forces of evil and destruction. And all the millions saw the thing, but some of a great clearness and of many doubtful, yet were all advanced more in spiritual sight and hearing than the normal peoples of this age. But of them all, none had the night hearing, to know a soul having speech in the ether half across the world. Yet, as I have said, some there had been aforetime who were thus given the hearing even as I was. And there came a monstrowakan to the master monstrowakan to make report that the influence had ceased to work upon the instruments. And by this thing we knew that in verity the force which proceeded out from the house of silence was cut off from us, and from those youths. And we had assurance that there fought a very mighty power for the salvation of the souls of the youths. And all the peoples were silent, save for an underbreath of wonder and talk, for all were utter stirred with hope and fear, perceiving that the youths had some chance given unto them to return. And whilst the youths yet wavered in their minds, and I perceived with the great spyglass and the knowledge of my soul and my natural wit, lo, the master Monstrowakan sent once more the great voice of the home call abroad into the land and immediately besought these youths for the sake of their souls and the love which their mothers had for them to come swiftly homewards, whilst they had yet this great power to shield them and allow them sweet sanity. And I thought that some did look towards the pyramid, as that they answered to the mighty voice of the home call, and did read the message which the master Monstrowakan made to them. But in a moment they faced about, seeming to have a good obedience to one who did always lead, and of whom I had inquired and found to be one named Ashkoff, who was a great athlete of the nine hundredth city. And this same Ashkoff, out of the boldness and bravery of his heart, did make unwitting to destroy the souls of them all. For he went forward, and leapt into the billows of the bright shining fire that made a barrier in the way of their destruction. And immediately the fire ceased from its shining, and gave way, and sank, and grew to a nothingness, and Ashkoff of the nine hundredth city began again to run towards the house of silence, and all that were with him did follow faithfully, and ceased not to run. And they came presently to the low hill whereon was that horrid house, and they went up swiftly, and they were two hundred and fifty, and wholesome of heart and innocent, save for a natural waywardness of spirit. And they came to the great open doorway that hath been open since the beginning, and through which the cold, steadfast light and inscrutable silence of evil hath made for ever a silence that may be felt in all the land. And the great uncased windows gave out a silence, and the light, aye, the utter silence of an unholy desolation. And Ashkoff ran in through the great doorway of silence, and they that followed, and they never more came out, or were seen by any human and it must be known that the mothers and the fathers of those youths looked out into the nightland and saw that thing which came to pass. And all the people were silent, and some said presently that the youths would come forth again, yet the people knew in their hearts that the young men had gone into destruction, for in truth there was that in the night which spoke horror to the souls of all, and a sudden utter quiet in all the land. But unto me, that had the night hearing, there came a great fear of that which might be whispered into my spirit out of the quietness of the night, of the agony of those young men. Yet there came no sound to the hearing of the soul, neither then nor in all the years that were to come, for in verity had those youths passed into a silence of which the heart cannot think. And here, will I tell you how that strange quiet which did fill all the land, seeming to brood within the night, was horrid beyond all roarings which had passed over the darkness in the time that went before, so that it had given my spirit some rest and assurance to hear but the far echoing, the low thunder of the great laughter, 
or the whining which was used at times to sound in the night from the southeast, or where the silver fire holes that open before the thing that nods, or the baying of the hounds, or the roaring of the giants, or any of those dreadful sounds which did often pass through the night. For they could not have offended me as did this time of silence. And so shall you judge how dreadful was that quiet, which did hold so much of horror. And surely it will be known that none had thinkings now, even in idle speech, that any should have power to succour the peoples of the lesser a doubt. Neither, as I have said, had any the knowledge of the place where it did stand. And so it was made plain that those peoples must suffer and come unhelped and alone to their end, which was a sad and dreadful thought to any. Yet had those within the great pyramid come already to such sorrow and calamity because of some had made the attempt in this matter, and there had been for gain only failure and the sorrow of mothers and the loneliness of wives and of kin, and now this dread horror upon us which concerned those lost youths. Now, as may be conceived, this sure knowledge that we might give no succour to the people of the lesser redoubt weighed heavy upon my heart. For I had, maybe with foolishness, held vague hopes and wonders concerning our power to make expedition secretly into the night, to discover that lesser pyramid, and to rescue those poor thousands. And above all, as may be thought, had I the thought of that sweet moment in which I should step forward out of the night and all mystery and terror, and put forth mine arms to Nani, saying, I am that one, and knowing in my soul that she had been mine in that bygone eternity, should surely know me upon the instant, and call out swiftly, and come swiftly and be again unto me in that age, even as she had been in this. And to think upon it, and to know that this thing should never be, but even in that moment of thought, she that had been mine in those elden days of sweetness might be even then suffering horror in that power of some foul monster. It was like a kind of madness, so that nearly I could seize the discos and run forth unprepared into the evil and terror of the nightland, that I should make one attempt to come to that place where she abode, or else to be cast off my life in the attempt. And oft did I call to Nani, and always I sent the master word beating through the night, that she might have assurance that it was indeed I that did speak unto her spirit, and no foul thing or monster, spelling evil and lies unto her. And oft I make to instruct her that never should she be tempted forth from the shelter of that redoubt in which she did live, by any message out of the night, but always to await the master word, and moreover to have a sure knowledge that none that was her friend would ever seek to entice her into the night. And this way, that way would I speak with Nani, sending my words silently with my brain elements. Yet it was doleful and weariful and dreadful always to have speech into the dark, and never to hear the answering beat of the master word and the sweet, faint voice whispering within my soul. Yet once and again would I have knowledge that the ether did thrill about me, weakly, and to mine inward hearing it would seem that the master word did beat faintly into the night and thereafter would my heart have a little comfort, in that I had assurance of a kind that the love made of my memory dreams did still live. And constant I put forth my soul to hark, so that my health failed me with the effort of my harking, and I would chide my being that I had not a wiser control, and so make a fight to do sanely. Yet day by day did my heart grow more weary and restless, for indeed it did seem that life was but a very little matter against so great a loss as my heart did feel to suffer. And oft at this time and that did there come a voice speaking plainly out of the night, and did purport to be the voice of Nani. But ever did I say the master word unto the voice, and the voice had no power by which it could make one answer. Yet I jeered not at the voice, to show contempt of its failing to bewit me, but let the matter bide, and the voice would be silent a time, and again would make a calling unto me, but never did I make speech with it, for therein lies the danger to the soul. But always did speak the master word to its silencing, and thereafter would shut the thing for my memory, and think only upon sweet and holy matters, as it might be truth 
and courage, more often of Nani, which was both sweet and holy to my spirit and heart and being. And so it was, I have set down. There were monsters without in the night that did torment me, having, it may be, intent to lure me into destruction, or indeed it doth chance that they had no hope but to plague me with malice. And as may be thought, all this considering of my trouble, and the giving of my strength unto Nani through the night of the world, that she might have comfort and help, did work upon me, so that I grew thin plainly to the eye of those that loved me. And the master Monstruwakan, he that did love me as I were his son, chided me gently, and had wise speech with me, so that I but loved him the more, yet without having gain of health. For my heart destroyed me, as if doth if love be held back, and made always to weep. And it may be thought strange that my mother and my father did not talk also with me, but I had neither mother nor father those many years, and this thing I should have set down early, so that none should waste thought pondering to no end, but the blame is in my telling. Now concerning my love trouble, there did happen a certain thing which gave me to decide, for one night I waked from a sore troubled sleep, and it did seem that Nani did call my name, mine olden love name, and in a voice of utter anguish and with beseeching. And I sat up in bed, and sent the master word into the night with my brain elements, and presently all about me there was the solemn beat of the master word answering, but weak, and gone faint that scarce I might hear it. And I called again with my brain elements unto Nani that was murdered, and spoke to give her assurance, and to haste to tell unto me that which was so wrong and pitiful with her. And who shall be amazed that I was shaken with the eagerness of my spirit, in that it was so long since Nani had spoken clear within my soul, and now, behold, her voice. Yet, though I did call many a time into the everlasting night, there came no more the voice of Nani speaking strangely within my spirit, but only at times a weak thrilling of the ether about me. And at last I grew maddened with the sorrow of this thing, and the sense and knowledge of harm about the maid. And I stood upright upon my feet, and I raised my hands, and gave word and honour unto Nani through all the blackness of the night, that I would no more abide within the mighty pyramid to my safety, while she, that had been mine own through eternity, came to horror and destruction by the beasts and evil powers of that dark world. And I gave the word with my brain elements, and bade her to be of heart, for that until I died I would seek her. But out of the darkness there came naught but silence. Then I clothed me swiftly, and went up quickly to the tower of observation that I might speak instant with the master Monstruwakan, for my heart burned in me to intention, and to be doing speedily that which I had set upon myself to do. And I came to the master Monstruwakan, and told all to him, and how that I did mean no more to suffer in quiet and to no end, but to make adventure into the nightland, that I find Nani or perchance find a swift peace from this long troubling. Now when the master Monstruwakan heard that which I had to say, it sat heavily upon him, and he besought me long and many times that I refrain from this thing, for that none might achieve so great a task, but that I should be lost in my youth before many days were gone by. Yet to all his speech I said naught, save that this thing was laid upon me, and even as I had promised, so should I make to act. And in the ending the master Monstruwakan perceived that I was set to this thing, and not to be moved, and he did put it to me that how I had grown to leanness with so much troubling, and that I should have wisdom to wait a while, that I put on my full strength. But even as I was, so I would go, and this I told to him gently, and showed how that thing which meet was helpful to the safety of my soul, for that my strength was still in me, yet I was sweeter in spirit, because I had stood lean and pure, and much poor dross and littleness had been burned from me, so that fear was not in me. And all do, I say, to count of my love, which doth purify and make sweet and fearless the human heart. And because I was even as I have said, so was I the less in trouble of the forces of evil, for long and sore had been my preparation of spirit, 
and I wot that none had ever gone forth into the darkness so long withholden from that which doth weaken and taint the spirit. And here let me set down how that the three days of preparation which were proper to those that willed to go forth into the nightland had for the chief aim the cleansing of the spirit, so that the powers of evil did have a less ableness to harm. But also it was, as I have said, that none should go forth in ignorance of the full dreadfulness of all that held the night. For it was at the preparation that there was made known certain horrors that were not told unto the young, and of horrid mutilations, and of abasements of soul that did shake the heart with fear, if but they were whispered into the hearing. And these things were not set down in any book that might be lightly come by, but were warded and safe locked by the master of the preparation in the room of the preparation. And indeed, when I did hear that which presently I was to hear, I had wonder in my heart that ever any went out into the night land, or that ever the room of preparation should have known other than students that meant not to go forth, but only to achieve some knowledge of that which hath been done, and mayhap shall be once again. Yet, in verity, is this but the way of the human heart, and hath always been and will be so in all the years for ever? For to adventure is the lust of youth, and to leave safety is the natural waywardness of the spirit, and who shall reprove or regret, for it were sorrowful that this spirit of man should cease? Yet must it not be thought that I do uphold fightings to the death or to mutilation between man and man, but rather do sorrow upon this thought, now, when the morrow came, if thus I shall speak of that which was outwardly even as night, though changing always within the pyramid, I went unto the room of preparation, and the door was closed upon me, and I underwent the full preparation, that I might have full power and aid to come to success through all the terror of the nightland. And three days and three nights did I abide within the room of preparation, and upon the fourth day was mine armour brought unto me and the master of the preparation stood away from me, silent and with sorrow upon his face, but touching me not, neither coming anigh to aid me, nor having any speech with me, for none might crowd upon me or cause me to answer. And presently was I clad with the grey armour, and below the armour a close-knit suit of special shaping and texture, to have the shape of the armour, and that I might not die by the cold of the nightland and I placed upon me a script of food and drink that might keep the life within me for a very great time by reason of its preparation. And this lay ready to me with the armour, and was stitched about with the mark of honour, so that I knew loving women thus to speed me. And when all was done and made ready, I took up the discos, and bowed in silence to the master of the preparation, and he went towards the door and opened it, and signalled that the people stand back, so that I might go forth untouched. And the people stood back, for many had crowded to the door of the room of preparation, so that I knew how that my story must be to the heart of all, in all the cities of the great redoubt. For to come unbidden anigh that door was against the lesser law, and that any erred in this matter betokened much. And I went out through the door, and there was a mighty lane of people unto the great lift, and about the great lift as I went downwards did the countless millions stand, and all in a great silence but having dear sympathy in their souls, yet loyal unto my safety in that none in all the mighty pyramid did make speech unto me, or call out aught. And as I went downward through the miles, lo, all the ether of the world seemed to be surged with the silent prayers and speedings of those quiet multitudes, and I came at last unto the great gate, and behold the dear master Monstrowakan did stand in full armour, and with the discos, to do me honour with the full watch as I went forth. And I looked at him quietly, and he looked unto me, and I bent my head to show respect, and he made silent salute with the discos. And afterwards I went onwards towards the great gateway, and they may dim the lights in the great causeway, that there should be no glare to go forth into the land when the gate was opened. And behold, they opened not the lesser gate within the greater for me, 
but did honour my journey in that they swung wide the great gate itself, through which a monstrous army might pass, and there was an utter silence all about the gate, and in the hushed light the two thousand that made the full watch held up each the discos, silently, to make salute, and humbly I held up the discos reversed, and went forward into the dark. And that's all for today, except to remind you of my Patreon account, where you can support my production of audiobooks. As a patron, you get access not just to the stories published here in the podcast, but also all the other books I record. At the moment, I'm recording Heart of Darkness, Volume 5 of A History of the Peninsular War, and a science fiction book called Masters of Space. Please, go to patreon.com and search for Felbrick. F-E-L-B-R-I-G-G. All support appreciated. This file is released on an attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time. CthulhuPodcast.co.uk